In this problem, we have two masses. We have mass one, which is up here on a frictionless table. And then we've got mass two, which is hanging off of a pulley. For this problem, the simplest kind, we have a massless pulley and a massless rope. So we just have two blocks. The second block has gravity acting on it, or weight force and a tension. The first one just has the tension and the rope pulling on it. It's important to notice that the tension is the same everywhere within. Now with these kinds of problems, the most important thing to do is to identify the object or objects here, M1 and M2, and to create a coordinate system that's convenient. In this case, the coordinate system that we're going to use, as you often use in a pulley, is one that sort of wraps around the pulley itself so that we define this as the positive direction. One could define it the other way, but I'm choosing to define it clockwise, which will be a little strange when we get to this mass because it's going down and yet it's positive. So it's a little different than what we did in kinematics. So the kinds of things we have to solve for are tension um, and acceleration is what I'm asking for. Uh, we're going to do it so that we're solving it just in terms of the letters. So sort of a general setup. We'll find acceleration, we'll find tension, and then we'll put in specific values for the masses, and we'll get the tension and the acceleration. And then we're going to do something that's a very important skill, and that is being able to look at limiting behavior. So what happens to the tension and the acceleration as mass 1 gets really big, or as mass 2 gets really big? So keep this picture in mind as we move on. I'm going to sketch a free body diagram first for object number 1, which is block on the frictionless table. Now there is a weight force and there is a normal force but I'm not that concerned about them because they cancel out. And I know that because the block isn't falling down, it's not flying into the sky, so it must be vertically in some sort of equilibrium. Horizontally is another matter. We have a force going this way which is tension or T. I want to write out Newton's second law. Remember, Newton's second law, we can apply in one direction at a time. In this problem, there really is only one linear dimension. Uh, F net equals MA. So the F net here is simply the tension. That's the only force acting in that direction. And that's going to equal M1 times the acceleration of the system, keeping in mind that that acceleration is going to be the same for both blocks. So this was M1. Now let's look at M2. M2, we have two forces. We have a weight force down, which is M2 times G, and then we have an upward force, tension. This magnitude of tension is the same as the tension that was up here in the first part. So when I write Newton's second law for this, we're going to get F net equals Mg minus T. At first this is unsettling for people because they're used to down being negative and up being positive. But remember, we've defined our coordinate system such that this is actually the positive direction. So that's why this, when we plug in here, is actually positive. So this is going to equal M2 times A. So let me go ahead and let me copy that. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it over here just to make it a little easier to follow. Now, I want to find the acceleration first. I don't know tension. I don't know acceleration. That's two things that are unknown. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula for the tension, and I'm going to plug that in for the tension here. So when I rewrite this, uh, I'm going to write it as... M2, M2, uh, M2G minus M1A from over here equals M2A. Usually I try to get A's together, G's together, things like that. So I'm going to rewrite this as M2G equals M1A plus M2A. Or m2g equals a times m1 plus m2 or 
a equals m2 over m1 plus m2 times g. Now notice this gives you some ratio of the acceleration due to gravity. It can never be bigger than one, which makes sense because when the only thing acting on you is a weight force, you shouldn't get an acceleration any larger than the acceleration due to gravity. So this won't let that happen. You also know you're on the right track when you get something that looks pretty elegant. So here's a ratio of the acceleration to gravity that, that usually lets you know you're on the same, uh, the right track. So this is the answer to part A. For part B, we're just going to plug into this equation over here, the T equals M1A. So the A from over here, when I write T equals M1A and I plug in, that's going to be the same as M1, M2 over M1 plus M2 times G. So we've answered that. For part C, we're just plugging in specific values. So for the acceleration, when I plug into this formula over here, we're going to get, well, let me write down the values. M1 is 10 kilograms and M2 is 5 kilograms. So when I plug in this equation here, we're going to get an M2, which is 5 kilograms over 10 kilograms plus 5 kilograms times G is going to give us one third of G. So the acceleration is going to be one third of the acceleration due to gravity. That kind of makes sense because if you look at this, the numbers we've picked, 10 and 5, this number is twice as big as this number for the mass. So gravity is only pulling on one third of the mass of this system. So it kind of makes sense that the acceleration would be one third of the total acceleration. So that's a good way to kind of check to see if it seems reasonable. Now to get the tension, the easiest way to do that is to just use what you've already found. So if T equals M1A, well, M1 was 10 kilograms, A was one third G, so the tension is going to be 10 thirds of G. Again, um, looks like a fairly nice, neat number. Uh, it's a function of the acceleration due to gravity. Um, it's kind of a good gut check. The last thing I want to do, and this is really important, is being able to talk about um, limiting behavior. So we have two situations to look at. Let me use how about blue. So let's look at, first of all, what happens if M1 is much, much greater than M2. In other words, what if M1 is huge? Well, the equation for acceleration goes as M2 over M1 plus M2 times G. So if M1 is huge, in other words, if this is huge, that effectively makes this fraction, this zero. When you have a really big number on the bottom, it doesn't really matter what's on the top, you get zero. So that's going to give you an acceleration that is approximately zero. That's also going to give you a tension, because tension equals M1A, that is approximately zero, or is at least very, very small. Let's see if this makes sense. If you look at the picture, if M1 is really, really big, and M2 is comparatively really, really small. Gravity's not pulling very hard on M2, so there's not going to be a lot of tension, and it's certainly not going to accelerate M1 a whole lot. So if this was like a giant elephant on top of the table, and this was just like a little gerbil that was hanging down, it wouldn't accelerate the elephant very much, even if it was frictionless. So that certainly makes sense. Uh, what if, on the other hand, M2 was much, much bigger than M1? So if M2 is much, much bigger than M1, we're going to look at the same equation, A equals M2 over M1 plus M2. So because M2 is very large, 
that's going to make m1 really tiny. So the bottom of the fraction is going to be essentially the same as the top of the fraction, which means the acceleration is going to be approximately g, approximately the acceleration due to gravity. Let's see if that makes sense. So if m2 is huge, then this is going to have a really big force on it. m1 is relatively small. That's not going to change the overall mass of the system. So the amount of mass being accelerated is pretty close to the amount of mass that gravity gets to pull on. Uh, it's not going to change the acceleration of the system much. So it's going to be almost the same as if you just dropped m2 without the tension attached, which is also going to mean that the tension is going to be pretty small. So the uh, Sorry about that. The tension is going to be very, very small. So we've now answered the questions. Again, with these problems, they start off the same way. You need to identify the objects. In this case, there's two of them, two blocks. You need to decide on a coordinate system. In this case, with a ramp, I like to think about it like one-dimensional but going around the pulley. So kind of around and clockwise here is the positive direction. When you get to problems with ramps or things like that, you may want to pick a direction that goes up the ramp as your coordinate system. So we pick a coordinate system. We draw free body diagrams for each of the individual objects. We apply Newton's second law, F equals MA. We do that in all components. And this direction was really, in this problem, was really all going over one direction. Uh, so there's no need to do a y per se, but you apply Newton's second law to the objects and in both coordinates, both axes, and you usually need to do some algebra to simplify so that you have an equation that only has one variable you don't know. At that point, you've won. Uh, it's not a bad idea to check your answer with some limiting behavior to see if it seems reasonable. Um, as these problems get more complex, you're going to apply the same strategy. There will just be more forces. For example, if we had friction here, this M1 wouldn't just have one force. It would have two forces. If it was on a ramp, we'd have to get components. But the, the, the idea is basically the same. So I hope that this helps you, as always. And uh, that's it.